What's up, Oklahoma? It's good to see you. My best friends, two husband, wife, best friends, graduated from OU. It's a little shout out to OU. No, nothing, nobody? <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's great to, uh, it's great to be here. Um, I just am so grateful I got to hear Vicky's talk a minute ago. Um, and if I, don't, if, I, if I start down that road, I'll abandon my talk and, and just talk about what I loved about her talk. So I'm not going to say any more about that right now. Uh, I may reference it later because it just um, reminded me, elements of it reminded me so much of my, my own experience. And so... And, and one thing I think um, that I, I resonate with something that you said at the end, Vicki, is that um, how important it is for um, secular people and atheists and um, especially to understand where Christians and especially fundamentalists are coming from, to understand kind of their, um, their way of thinking and their, the rationality that exists inside of the framework of their, uh, their worldview. And, and so I hope that I can... Um, just add one more um, slice of, of that picture today by talking a little bit about my story and my experience of uh, my faith and what ultimately led me to the place uh, where I am now. And I sometimes help people think about my belief system and, and why rational people can have faith for so long by asking them to imagine, as I'll ask you now to imagine, that you lived before the Copernican Revolution Imagine that we lived all those years ago. You would be like everyone else in the entire world, believing that the sun, the moon, and the stars were moving in a pattern around the earth. Whether you were an uneducated laborer, a scientist, a theologian, you would have made the same observation that was obvious to everyone around you, that the sun and the moon move across the sky each and every day. All you have to do is look up there at night and you can see it happen. The sun rises, the sun sets, the moon rises, the moon sets. It's plain to see that these heavenly bodies are moving around the earth, right? Can I get a witness? <laughs> on top of that, you would have had the Bible to back you up. In the book of Joshua, it says, On the day that the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and you, moon, over the valley of Aijalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, till the nation avenged itself on its enemies, as it's written in the book of Jashar. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about half a day, a full day, sorry. There has never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a human being. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Now the writer of Joshua may have confessed a bit too much uh, with that last bit, but the early geocentrists had the Bible on their side, which is of course why the religious authorities had so much trouble with Galileo and Copernicus. In the 15th century, if someone asked you whether you believe the earth was the center of the universe, you might well have balked at the question. You might have said, well, of course, but why do you ask? It would be something like me asking if you believe that the air we're breathing is made up of about 78% nitrogen and 21% oxygen. You would say, well, yeah, I don't really, it's not really a belief. I mean, I, we know that that's true, right? Um, so why would you ask? I begin with this analogy because I, this is how I was taught to believe in God. Not maliciously, not to trick me, not to manipulate me, but with great love and care by my parents and grandparents. Some people arrive at their God beliefs after an adult conversion, but I was raised in a Christian home that took God's existence for granted the way that I take the chemical composition of the air for granted. I've never run my own tests, but I believe it's true. I remember with great fondness many Sabbath afternoon conversations about theology and history and science and all the rest. Members of our church would visit our home along with the visiting uh, preacher, uh, would come for lunch. And as a young boy, I felt so privileged to sit at the dinner table with these wise men and women. And, th and I, I think it was in those conversations that I first became a theologian. We would talk about biblical chronology. We would talk about where the dinosaurs fit within biblical chronology. That was always a fun one. 
But it usually began with me going like, but where did the dinosaurs fit in? And the bones seem pretty old. We talked about the nature of Jesus, how Jesus could be both God and a human at the same time. We talked about creation and evolution, but we never talked about one question. And I'm sure you've guessed what that question is. It is, does God exist? And if, of course, the answer to that would have been yes. So the the more important question is, how do we know that God exists? Nobody ever asked that question. It was the assumption, the starting point for every other conversation that we had. We just knew that God existed. It was just assumed. I was growing up with my grandparents in in high school. I I lived with my grandparents in Central California near Yosemite. Yosemite was sort of like our our playground during my, my growing up years in high school. And my grandparents were spiritual giants to me. When my, my grandfather prayed, I just knew that he was talking to God. I could feel it. Um, you know, I heard other people pray, and I figured they were just saying the same prayer they said all the time. In fact, some people I went to church with that always prayed up front, I knew for sure that they were saying the same prayer because I heard it every week. But when my grandfather prayed, it was different. It was conversational. It was full of pathos. It was, it was a, I could feel a connection between him and the divine, between him and something much bigger. And uh, I'd had a rough childhood, um, and I was living with my grandparents as a way of um, escaping that childhood. And, um, and so I, I was very drawn to my grandparents' confidence and the strength of their family and the values that they had and, and wanted me to have. Yet still, I did the sinful things that high school kids do. I listened to rock music. I messed around with my girlfriend. Actually, come to think of it, that's about all I did. (laughs) I never drank, not a drop. Didn't smoke. Other drugs were as unthinkable as God not existing. I kept the Sabbath. We were Seventh-day Adventists, which meant that our Sabbath began on Friday night at sundown and went to Saturday night at sundown. And, you know, in high school, all the interesting things happened between Friday night sundown and Saturday night sundown. All the dances, all the football games, all the other extracurricular activities, all the parties. Uh, But I kept the Sabbath, even though it meant missing every event, including my prom. Um, Actually, the girls that I asked to go to the prom with me didn't want to go with me anyway, so I didn't really have a reason to go to the prom, but I used the Sabbath as the excuse. You know, I just couldn't go because because I have to keep the Sabbath. Um, So when I went to college, I got really serious about my faith. I threw away all my music, all those cassette tapes of the Beatles that I had recorded off of my friend's uh, albums. Um, You know, it was really, you know, Bob Dylan, that really mind-rotting secular music. I broke up with my girlfriend, and I made a clean start. I was going to be spiritual, committed to God uh, fully. And I, would, I was really serious about it, and I, and I was actually a physics and a math major when I started uh, college. I, I was an astrophysics and math major, to be honest. I, 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 ever since I was a kid, I wanted to be an astronaut. I know no other kid has ever wanted to do that, um, but I did. I wanted to be an astronaut. Um, I'm reading this book, Martian, The Martian, right now. The movie's about to come out, and just reliving all my childhood fantasies about being an astronaut and sort of being glad I I didn't decide to do that. Um, So I, I, but I was, so I was, I I had this interest in science, but I also had a deep interest in God and and spirituality. And I would get up every morning and walk with my, with with God, with with Jesus. I would get up early. Uh, The college that I went to was in Central California, Napa Valley, actually, a great place for a teetotaling religious school uh, in the heart of the best wine country outside of Europe. and uh, never tasted a drop of wine the whole time I was there. It's a very sad story. Um, I've been back since and, and kind of made up for lost time. But, but uh, I, uh, yeah, so I, I just had this deep desire to be uh, with God. And I would go for these long walks in the forest around the college. Called, it's called Pacific Union College. And I, I remember feeling and sensing and knowing even that God was walking with me and that we would have this two-way conversation and God would answer me. Sometimes the, you know, atheists will say, well, God never answers back. Oh, yes, he, he spoke to me. Um, we had these long conversations. And when I would see 
uh, a beautiful bird you know, that I hadn't seen before fly across my path or a deer would come out from the forest. I, I just knew that God had put that there for me to express his love for me and to, um, just to remind me that I was loved and valued. Uh, I had intense, these intense times of, of prayer and Bible study. I got in with a very, very conservative group of um, students that were um, also very interested in, in that same sort of a fundamentalist path. Um, and in, in academically, as I said, I started in math and physics, but I, then I went quickly to English when I decided I was too much of a people person to spend endless hours in the lab doing experiments. I already knew what the results would be. Uh, and, and then in English, I couldn't stay English major because the prophet of the, uh, of the Adventist church said that we shouldn't read infidel authors. In fact, we shouldn't really even read any fiction uh, because it was untrue and we should spend our time reading God's word. And, and the book, that a first book on the reading list in my freshman English class was Candide by Voltaire at an Adventist college. And I was way too familiar with my faith to, to buy that. And so I went to the teacher and I said, well, you know, I can't read this book. You know as well as I do that Ellen White specifically names Voltaire as someone not to read. And I brought chapter and verse, or page number, as it were, and, and, and showed her where Ellen White says, you are not allowed to read infidel authors, especially Voltaire and, and Thomas Paine is the other one that she names, and she did not like Thomas Paine. And, uh, and she said, well, you know, you have to understand it's a story, and these, it's, it's the it's sort of the... Um, the story, the quest, you know, uh, uh, motif that we're trying to tease out of these stories. And I was like, yeah, yeah. But still, it's, it's you know, Voltaire. And so she gave me, bless her heart, she gave me an independent study that I was able to uh, explore. She wanted me to explore deeper my ideas around literature and the inappropriateness of certain forms of literature. So I did that independent study. And then in the end, I wrote a paper reaffirming uh, my, my belief that I shouldn't read these infidel authors. So I knew I couldn't be an English teacher or an English major because um, all that stuff's bad. So I, I became a history major because, of course, history is straightforward um, and clear, full of facts. <laughs> um, and we'll just do that because history is sort of like science, right? You just know things. And, and, uh, and, so I, and I loved history, but I knew I would be very poor uh, as a history major because um, what do history majors do? besides teach history, I guess, you know, and although there is, you know, very, maybe you go to be law school, go to law school, that was totally not in my mind at that time. Um, so I became pre-med, which is what every, you know, self-respecting Seventh-day Adventist does, um, if you're a man, um, and, and so I started down that path and um, took all the pre, pre-requirements for medical school when I did finally decided that really my avocation in theology was what I wanted to do. I really, I was a, a fan of the Bible, of course, as I've been saying, and I thought, you know, why am I avoiding the obvious? You know, I should be a pastor. And when I did that, all of my family and friends were like, finally, you know, you realize the thing that we've, we've sensed all along is that this is your path, this is your calling. People ask me how I knew I was called, and I think mostly it was that. It was the affirmation of my family and friends who said, you're a good public speaker, reasonably so, and it was bad back then, I'm sure. I don't know how they would ever have, have said that at age like 20 or whatever. But, and, and you have a passion for the church. You love God. This is what you should do. And I thought, OK, that makes sense. I was dying for the affirmation of adults in my life, like most kids. And um, so I did. And when I did that, I decided, you know, even this college was not fundamentalist enough for me. I really needed to get serious now because I was going to be a pastor. So I transferred to a little unaccredited Bible college in the mountains outside of Reno, Nevada, and called Weimar, which is just the name of the town. And I went to Weimar College and graduated from there, a very, a very fundamentalist um, school. The women were not allowed to wear pants, um, even in the garden. Uh, we didn't, there was no uh, meat in the cafeteria. Uh, men and women were not allowed to date until their junior year. Um, and it's just lots of like, you know, strict rules like that. It was actually at Weimar, it's a story for another time, it was actually at Weimar that I, I think I became a more grace-oriented Christian and it began that process of change. 
After that, I started off, my very first church was in Pennsylvania in the suburbs of Philadelphia. I was, I was 22 years old, and I had three churches in the suburbs of, of Philadelphia that I was responsible for. And it was there that I began the slow, gradual liberalization of my beliefs. I recognized that people, the members of my congregation primarily, did not fit within this small, little, hermetically sealed theological worldview that I developed for myself in the college. And, and, uh, and they were yet, they were wonderful people, sort of like what Vicky was saying, like here were these really great people um, doing really wonderful things. In this case, they were also Christians, but they weren't my kind of Christians. They were, you know, doing really, you know, off the wall things like smoking cigarettes, uh, wearing jewelry, um, really eating meat, uh, you know, doing stuff that's really taboo for Adventists. And I thought, yeah, they could probably love Jesus and do those things too. Um, and so I, that was liberal for me. Like, that was stretching the boundaries of my faith. And, and I had some really wonderful mentors in that church. The, the lay leaders of that church were so good to me and uh, just slowly started seeding liberal ideas. Um, and I think I was always a liberal at heart. I mean, I, I love people more than anything else. For me, I, people trump ideas. And, and so um, I think I was predisposed to allow people to shape me. Uh, and I just needed to be exposed to different and more different kinds of people. So then I went to seminary after that, after four years of being a pastor, and it was there that my theology further expanded and widened. Um, and I didn't even go to a liberal seminary. I went to the Seventh-day Adventist seminary. I still believed in God and miracles and all the rest, but there was a widening chasm for me between Adventist beliefs and where I felt my belief system moving. I was exposed in seminary to the liberal, 20th century liberal theologian, R Rudolf Bultmann, uh, who was the famous uh, theologian who talked about demythologizing the Bible, um, taking the, the Bible but not reading it literally, admitting that there are clearly no miracles because none of us have ever really seen one. And so how do we read the Bible as a, from a liberal perspective, from a modern scientific perspective? And uh, I knew next to nothing about modern liberal theology at that point, and I was being taught it in this class so as to prepare me to counteract that kind of theology, right? Because um, you need to know your enemy. But it sort of stuck with me. I was like, that makes a lot of sense, you know? Like, here's a guy who's a theologian, famous theologian, a pastor, and he doesn't believe in miracles. I didn't even know such a thing was possible. Uh, so I was like, well, that sounds pretty cool. Um, there's a famous story of Rudolf Bultmann that sort of illustrates his worldview. He, it was Easter, and he was giving a sermon at a, you know, well, he was already well-known at that time, so it was a big church. And his student, many of his students were there for that Easter sermon, and he gave this powerful sermon about the resurrection of Jesus and the power that's resident in the resurrection of Jesus for us to live good lives. And his students pulled him aside afterwards and said, Professor Bultmann, you don't believe that. You don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And he said, well, I know, but they do, right? And, and so this was kind of his, it was like mythology, right? It was useful mythology that he could share with the congregation. And uh, I didn't embrace Boltman's view at that point. I, I was a seed that was planted in my mind uh, of another way of thinking. I didn't question the existence of God, not even close. But I did start to see the Bible as more human and less divine. It was around that same time that I was taking another class from a man I deeply respected and still respect very much about miracles and healing. And in that class, he was arguing that miracles do happen uh, and that the reason that we don't see more miracles uh, in our lives is because of our modern skeptical thinking, that if we, we don't have a predisposition to see it and so it goes unnoticed in right in front of us, and that faith in part means expecting the unexpected. And so I was drawn to this idea because I wanted to hold on to my faith, and this man was a man of God uh, in, in the best sense of that word. I know that probably doesn't resonate as a positive thing maybe, but I mean it in a positive way. Um, and modern Western cultural domination being what it was and what it is, I was intrigued by the idea that maybe my experience of God was being clouded by my post-enlightenment thinking. Like maybe it's just that I'm not open to the possibility of God, and if I were more, I would see more evidence for God. But try as I might, and though I couldn't confess it to anyone, I felt myself choosing Boltman's side. It was the wrong side. I, I knew it, and I couldn't tell anyone, but I was choosing Boltman's side. Well, I went back to ministry after seminary. It was September or October 2000. My daughter was born that month. 
uh, that w- we, we left seminary and drove back to Philadelphia to where I would take my next church. And on the radio, as we were driving, were the Bush v. Gore uh, de- legal debates around the, the hanging chads and all the rest. Um, and my daughter was like three weeks old, and we were driving back, you know, and everything was great. I was done with graduate school. I was going back to ministry. I was so much smarter than I was before, and I was ready for the challenge. And a, a year later, less than a year later, um, some really uh, evil people drew, flew airplanes into buildings just about an hour from where I lived. And, uh, and of course, like so many people, that event turned my life uh, in another direction. My theology after 9-11 took a sharp turn to the political. It was like waking up from a dream for me, um, realizing how Christian theology had been complicit with American imperial ambitions, that, that the church was essentially nothing more than a chaplain to, to Americanism, if you, if, you, if you will. And I was disgusted. I was revolted. I couldn't believe, especially coming from the radical Reformation side of the church and um, not the, you know, sort of magisterial tradition like the Episcopals, how I had missed this. And after 9-11, the days immediately after 9-11, all the movable lettering signs around my city changed. And, and what do you suppose was on those movable lettering signs? God bless America. You know, a harmless expression of solidarity, right? And yet, for the first time, I saw that as like, almost like warmongering. Uh, because here was a guy who had inspired other guys to fly airplanes into buildings on the basis that God was blessing them, right? And our response was to say, "Uh uh-uh, God blesses us, right? Like, that that was sort of our reaction, like, no, God's on our side, um, not on your side. And we went to war. A year or so later, I had another experience with different movable lettering signs, which always leads me to warn people to never have a movable lettering sign outside of your business. It's really dangerous, bad things can happen. Someone is liable to put some stupid shit on that sign that you will regret. So just avoid movable lettering signs. The flashy neon ones, even worse. Much easier to change. And uh, yeah, bad news. So I was driving to my church from my house, which was like a mile. And on my way, there were three other churches. I kid you not. Well, I'm, we're in Oklahoma, you understand. So, uh, <laughs> I, so I drove down the street. <laughs> Right across the street from my church was an Orthodox Presbyterian church. Well, for me, Presbyterians, they're those Sunday worshipers, so they were already like, like liberal. But Orthodox Presbyterians, I come to find out, very conservative, made me look liberal, right? So I uh, had phoned them a few times to see if there was a ministerial association. No callback. Um, their sign that day said, and it was one of those really hot, humid, well, yeah, you know. And I was driving by the sign, and the sign said, you think it's hot out here, dot, dot, dot. And I thought, my first thought was, God, it's so stupid and corny. And my second thought was, Does, do they really think that someone's driving by that sign and they say to themselves, self, let's go to that church on Sunday? <laughs> right? Just, clear, just purely from a marketing perspective, like, Who reads that sign and thinks, oh, yeah, those hateful people sound like wonderful friends. Let's go there. They want me to burn in hell unless I come to be with them. Yay. You know, like, I was just like, this is just a bad sign. Even as a Christian, it's just a horrible, horrible thing to them. They probably thought they were being super clever. um, But I was just like, "This this is awful. And then I had a third thought, totally unbidden, that came into my mind. And that thought was this. I would not easily become a Christian if I wasn't one already. And I was like, what to do with that? (laughs) Um, And people would ask me, why did you stay Adventist, you know, since you're not that Adventist anymore? And I'd say, well, it was a tradition I was born into, grow where you're planted, um, trying to make a difference from within. Um, And, and you know, I bought that. And 
and I thought the same about Christianity. Like, no, just because I wouldn't easily become one doesn't mean there's not something redeemable here, and it's my job to figure out how to redeem it. And, and it was 10 more years before I realized the import of that unbidden thought. I wouldn't easily become a Christian if I wasn't one already. The other reason I thought that is that I had been trying to convince some smart adults to become Christians. Um, and it's very difficult if you've ever tried. It's, it's not that easy. Um, so then, you know, I became more and more disillusioned with my, my faith as it was, I was finding it harder and harder to fit my experience of reality in with my, uh, my teaching and my understanding of the Bible. And it was around that time I got invited to move to Hollywood to be the pastor of the Hollywood Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I always wanted to be a, in a big city. I always wanted to have a, an urban ministry. And, I, and the church was like on its last leg, about 25 people, and I thought, this is perfect. You know, there's an opportunity to rebuild something here, something fresh, something new, innovative, and I said, sure. And we moved our family to Hollywood, which, as you know, is the center for all the world's homemade religions. <laughs> it's home to Scientology, Kabbalah, yoga studios everywhere, African-American megachurches, the cult of wealth and fame. Uh, so. You know, anything you want, and you can actually, more, more than this, it's even, it's even better, you can mix all of those things together if you like. You can be a little bit, you know, Kabbalah and a little bit Christian and go to science. Well, no, if you go to Scientology, it's pretty much all in. Um, and, but all those other things, you can kind of mix a little bit and, and be a little of this and a little of that. All along this journey, I'm becoming more progressive in my theology, but also more committed to orthopraxy than orthodoxy. If right believing is so hard to accomplish, and there's so many different right beliefs, right? Like, as, as all of you so often point out on the interwebs, you know, there are so many right beliefs. Which one shall we choose? And, and I realized that the more I got involved with interreligious conversations, that we can't all be right. And so maybe ortho, orthodoxy is not the important thing. Orthopraxy is really the right thing. Right acting, right behaving, right living, um, sort of like humanism. And I, as I became more of a Christian humanist, I became more at odds with my denomination um, with regard to pretty much everything, but just to narrow it down, um, their stand on LGBT people and relationships, evolution, and of course the, the doubling down on Adventism's special uniqueness. So I know, again, probably none of you have any experience with this, but Adventist Church thinks they're the only real one. They're the only remnant one. They're the only one that's, you know, everyone else is okay. They'll probably be saved by the skin of their teeth, as it says in Jude, you know, as plucked as from the fire, barely making it. But if you really want to be safe, you should probably come and join with the Adventists because they have the special last day message. And I just, you know, I just couldn't do it. And the way I couldn't do it, the way I handled that was I just didn't talk about it in my church. If you came to my church, you would never hear about that. And after a while, the denomination begins to wonder, why at Ryan's church you never hear about that? Um, so they began to challenge me about it. Um, around that time, too, 2008 election, California tried to outlaw same-sex marriage um, and pro what we called Proposition 8. Uh, and it worked. They, they, for a time, did change the Constitution to uh, outlaw same-sex marriage. And the Adventist church, with its history of religious liberty activism, and I'm not joking about that, actually supported Proposition 8. I couldn't believe it. And so a group of us, about six of us, I call us the Prop 8-6, uh, started an organization called um, Adventists Against Prop 8. And uh, we all nearly lost our jobs at that point. I was the most vulnerable because I was a fireable pastor. Um, so all of this comes to a head around March of 2013. And I just want to check the time here. Um, I was used to being called into my boss's office to account for my actions, um, whether it was a blog I had written about immigration reform or a petition uh, to stop Proposition 8 from being endorsed by the Adventist Church or my observance of the liturgical calendar, you know, which is a very Christian thing uh, in a decidedly non-liturgical church. But by 2013, I had worn out my welcome and I was asked to resign from my position. Um, he wanted me to quit and I was making him fire me because I liked my job and my church liked me and I liked them. I probably had a 95% approval rating in my church, um, but they wanted me to quit. And I was like, why would I do that? I'd be like quitting the job that you love the most. Who does that? And there was no payout either. It was not like, here, we'll give you half a million dollars to quit the job you love. It was more like, bye. You know, so 
I said, no, I'm not going to quit. You have to fire me. Like, if you think I'm doing a bad job, it's on, the onus is on you to say, we don't need your services anymore, which they eventually did. Um, and I felt my world begin to fall apart. I describe it like a game of Jenga, which is sort of a quick way of not boring you with all the details, but you know how Jenga works. You pull out a few blocks, and for a while it's easy going, and then there's that one fateful block that you pull and everything falls down. And uh, losing my job w at the church was that block. Now, it turns out that that structure probably needed to fall down, um, so it, it turned out to be okay, but as it's falling, it never feels okay. Um, and I, I lost my marriage during that time. Um, I w ended up uh, living in my dad's condo uh, in his, his wife's bedroom, not her bedroom, sorry, her, in her room, her like doll room actually, it was where she kept her doll collection, like 50 dolls, and the room was like the size of one of these squares, it seems like, on the, on the stage here. So I'm in this like twin bed, I haven't slept in a twin bed since I was in college, and, and it, the room is painted hot pink. <laughs> and I know you don't believe me when I say hot pink, it's hot pink. And these dolls are like staring down on me from the bookcase. It was so creepy. And I thought, this is, this is the bottom of the barrel. Like, this is, this is my life. This is, where I've, this is what's happened to me now. I was, you know, almost at the point, like, would God take me back? You know, I didn't. Um, and at the end of that year, I knew I was at a crossroads. Um, I, I saw no future for myself in religion. I had looked for some churches to be a part of that weren't Adventist. And quickly found out that they had some of the same problems and different ones that I didn't have that I didn't like either. Um, and, and at that moment, I was reminded of something my boss said to me in our very last conversation before he fired me. He said, Ryan, don't you think you've outgrown the Seventh-day Adventist Church? And of course, that idea had been in my head for a long time, maybe up to eight years. And, but I never thought I would hear it from him, the president of the conference in, you know, the Los Angeles County, Ventura County region, you know, he was the one suggesting to me, maybe I'd outgrown the church. And I, I said, well, maybe, but what does that mean to you? Like, is that, are you okay with that? Are you comfortable with the idea that one outgrows this? I mean, I didn't say all of this, but I thought, like, what does this say for him? You know, toward the end of his life, close to retirement, like, I've outgrown it and he's still comfortable with it? Or... Or what does it all mean? And then he changed the metaphor and upped the stakes and said, I think, Ryan, you're like a bird that's outgrown the cage. And I was like, wow, he's comparing the church to a cage. Even I would not have thought of such a thing at that moment. It would never have dawned on me to think of the church as a cage. And, I, and I, in, my, in, my moment, in that moment, I thought to myself, yes, this is, this is right. This is what's happened. And what do birds do? And so I, I flew away. And by the end of that year, I'll, I'll skip over some, some boring details, I was really at the end of my exploration of the options that I had available to me, and I decided that I needed to really understand uh, the one thing I had not yet considered that would potentially make sense of all of this, which is that there actually isn't a God, right? It wouldn't have, you know, that, that would, you know, actually uh, be a potential answer to a lot of questions that I had. Um, I didn't like the prospect of that answer. Um, so I started a blog, and, and literally, folks, like, I know some of you thought I was really pulling your leg. My friend and I discussed this over some Thai noodles, and by that afternoon, I had bought the URL, yearwithoutgod.com. By two days later, I had edited the blog post that became that first blog post and threw it up at Huffington Post, where I already had a blog. Uh, so it was not premeditated when the first reporter said to me, so there must have, a lot of thought must have gone into this. Like, what's the strategy here for a year without God? I was like, yeah, no, there's really, really not much of a strategy, actually. I just, I think I'm at the end of the rope here, and I haven't considered this, so I'm just going to explore atheism. Explore atheism. What does it mean, explore atheism? How, how do you plan to do that? Um, I think I'll talk to some folks who are atheists and find out why, and maybe visit some atheist gatherings if such things exist. Uh, I quickly found out that there were many. And so many podcasts. Who knew? How many podcasts? Good Lord. I'm going to start one soon myself. And uh, so, I was, so that was kind of my journey. I sort of stumbled into it. And it was really inquisitive podcasters and journalists who pressed me to explain, what the hell are you doing? You can't just put on atheism like a pair of pants. And I thought about that. And I was like, yeah, you know, that's, that makes sense. You probably 
right? So that's, that's probably not possible, right? You can't just put atheism on like a pair of pants. That makes sense. So what am I doing? You know, like, I, so I was just shaping it as I was going. I was trying to figure out, okay, what am I trying to do? And I was essentially, I, would, I finally said, look, when you go into a movie, right? Let's say you go to watch Lord of the Rings. And you, you go into this movie. And you sit down, and the credits, the opening screens come up, and then, and then the action starts, right? And the first thing you probably think as you're watching that movie is, there are no orcs. That's so stupid. There's no hobbits. Oh, come on. What a load of crap. Right? No, you're like, this is a fun story, right? You're sort of engaged in the story. You suspend disbelief for the length of the movie so that you can enjoy the movie. And then you walk out and you go, well, of course, there's nobody's going to attack me in the parking lot, right, with an axe. You know, I, I'll probably be all right. And, and so for me, it was the reverse, like leaving faith behind and experimenting with atheism, if you will, was like, what if I could, not saying that I can entirely, but what if I could suspend belief rather than suspending disbelief? And I could say to myself, what if God doesn't exist? What would the world look like? Would it be dismal and nihilistic? Or would it be just the same as it always is? Or would my family disown me? Or would I, would people hate me? Or would people love me? Or would people be just apathetic about it or, or what so that was sort of my my effort I, I and then I you know in closing here I, I just what I'm hoping to, to illustrate in all of this is that for some people in fact let me ask I usually ask how many of you were Christians well first of all how many of you were Christians okay now keep your hand up if you if you um, lost your faith suddenly by just an epiphany or some stupid thing that happened, you're like, forget it, I'm out. Put your hand down. Okay, so the rest of you had this slow evolution, right? Okay, you can put your, all put your hand. That wasn't very scientific, but... So, so probably most of us were like, ah, it seems like bullshit, but it's pretty deeply ingrained in me, and my family's pretty connected to it, and maybe I can make sense out of it somehow. And you spend a number of years, maybe 10 or 50, trying to, like, unwind that, uh, untangle that Gordian knot. And at some point, you're like, you know, fuck it. Like, I, the, the knot's too, too complicated to untangle. There's, there's no knot, you know? Like, so um, that was my experience. I call it the slow death of God because it was, I was really trying to nurture God on life support for a very long time. And I, I don't mean to trivialize that metaphor at all. Like, if any of you have lost loved ones over a long, protracted illness, you know that that is extremely painful. And eventually, you come to a place in that experience where you say... I have to face this, the end of this. And, and I think for me, it was a little bit like losing a loved one in that way. It was a painful experience to go through. Um, and it took a lot of going through the stages of grief, denial, compromise, negotiation, all of those stages, which I don't all remember uh, at the moment. But you come to the place of acceptance at the end. And I eventually understood in my own sense of understanding um, that, as, as I said to another podcaster just Thursday, I was, I was searching for truth. Now, very quickly, I need to add a caveat that I don't think that truth with a capital T is available to us so that we can just like go get it off the shelf and have it and put it in our pocket. Like truth isn't like that. Truth is always evading us in some sense and we're always searching for more. So it's never like you can finish that quest. But I was searching for truth and I wanted to know and part of the quest for truth is, is the search for the simplest explanation possible. Right? What, what makes the most sense? So if I want to walk from here to the back of the room, I could go all the way around the building in the parking lot and come back there, or I could just walk down the back aisle right, and go to the back of the room. And I felt at some point like my Christian faith was like me going out the back, around the parking lot, only so that I could arrive there. And then when I got to the back with Matt and Seth, I would say, you see, I got to the same place you're at. And they'd say, well, you walked all the way around the building. It's hot out there. And like, why would you put yourself through that? And, 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 it, and besides, you could get lost out there. And it's, you know, like, why not just walk to the back of the room? It's so much simpler. And I think this for me was God was an unnes became an unnecessary layer of explanation, which actually didn't have explanatory power for me anymore. And it just became simpler, um, sort of like a, I've been calling this like vestigial God. You know, like your appendix. You just don't really need it anymore. Sometimes it gets inflamed and it's just better to get rid of it. And, and, uh, and so, so I just decided that the, 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 the cost-benefit analysis, you know, it, there was a lot to lose. But, but I think, and I'll just close on this, um, that, that a painful truth is better, at least for me, than 
a comforting lie. And, and I would, so that's, that's my challenge to people, yourselves, and anyone else who's on this journey, um, that even though the truth may seem painful, I think truth is more important um, than, than deception or self-deception. And, um, and that, that's been proved true for me. And I appreciate your hospitality and your encouragement. Many of you, I know many of you have encouraged me along the way. And so thank you so much for your support.